Oh, I can't read that. My goodness. Uh, good morning. Uh, the committee will come to order. And before we begin, I would like to ask unanimous consent for our colleague, Representative Tim Ryan from Ohio, to sit, in, uh, sit on the dais and particip to participate in today's hearings without objection, so ordered. With that procedural note out of the way, welcome and thank you all for joining us this morning. During the Civil War, it was called Soldier's Heart. During World War I, it was called Shell Shock. During World War II, it was called Battle Fatigue. Today, we know it as post-traumatic stress. And last fiscal, the last fiscal year alone, almost 600,000 veterans sought care for it in the Department of Veterans Affairs. Today's hearing, we're going to discuss whether the current system of VA health care services and benefits effectively promotes wellness and supports veterans with PTSD in seeking treatment. VA exists to provide veterans with PTSD or any other condition that may be connected to a veteran's time in uniform with the care they need to live healthy, whole lives. Accordingly, the array of benefits and services that VA provides to veterans who have been diagnosed with PTSD is most impressive and expanding. And I'm encouraged by the plethora of treatment programs, both traditional and non-traditional, that VA offers, by the increasing number of partnerships with private sector and non-for-profit uh, providers, organizations that VA is entering into to better support those with PTSD, and by the innovative research that VA is continually investing in to gain a deeper understanding of how veterans can overcome PTSD, including one important study that's going on right now to evaluate the use of service dogs for veterans with PTSD. I very much support the research and look forward to reviewing its results when they become available. I also look forward to holding a separate hearing this Congress to discuss more in-depth an issue we will briefly touch on this morning, the benefits of complementary and integrative medicine for veterans and actions needed to spread both the awareness and the availability of non-traditional techniques that can do a world of good for those struggling. But this morning, I want to focus on the perennial problem of PTSD among our nation's veterans and what more we as a grateful nation can be doing to support veterans who may be struggling to seek help and to embrace recovery. Thanks to the quantum leaps in battlefield traumatic medical care, there are fewer casualties as, today, as a result of today's conflicts than there have been in previous wars. Yet the mental strain that some, certainly not all, but some of our veterans face seem to be taking a heavier toll than it perhaps has ever before. Since 2010, the number of veterans receiving care for PTSD from the VA healthcare system has grown by more than 50%. And despite historic and ever increasing investments in VA mental health services and supports since the turn of the century, suicide rates among veterans with PTSD are not declining. Despite all the good, well-intentioned work that's been done, clearly we must do more to reduce the stigma against seeking care, to break down institutional barriers that prevent veterans from accessing the services they need, to encourage veterans with PTSD that they can overcome their current challenges and lead full lives, and most importantly, to foster connection and healing veteran to veteran. We are joined this morning by a distinguished and diverse group of panelists, three of whom are veterans themselves. What their testimony will tell you is that they need to recalibrate our current system of care for veterans with PTSD and focus our efforts on wellness-based peer support programs that foster community, connection, and conversation between veterans one-on-one, -on -one, where they will argue most of the real healing begins, and on making it easier for veterans who know they need help to seek care without having to wait in line or jump through bureaucratic hoops for that first appointment. If there's one overarching message that I want to get out this, at this hearing, it's that PTSD is a treatable condition. It is not a sign of weakness or defeat, and it does not have to represent a life of incapacity. For any veteran who may need it, there's hope. There's help, and there's healing, available both within the VA health care system and in your home communities. There are other veterans who are ready, willing, and able to walk with you. And with that, our focus as policymakers is on trying to make it easier for you. Now, I appreciate our witnesses being here to discuss this important topic and in some cases to share their very personal stories with us this morning. And now I want to yield to Ranking Member Walls for any opening comments that he may have. Well, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank you for your leadership in this. You and I have uh, had our entire career in Congress here together on this committee, and uh, you have been a champion of this since the day I got here, uh, this addressing the, the issues and a holistic approach to our veterans' health care. And for that, I'm uh, grateful, and you're uh, your proactive approach to scheduling this hearing, and I agree with you, putting together a, an all-star panel is, is greatly appreciated. I also want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the unanimous consent to allow our colleague, the gentleman from Ohio, who's joining us today. Congressman Ryan's been a leader in Congress, promoting wellness through mindfulness, social, and emotional learning, and encouraging veterans to incorporate healthy practices into their daily lives. I uh, look forward to working with him. He's introduced Veterans Wellness Act of 2017, was an active uh, force behind putting this panel together. So so thank you, Mr. Ryan. To our witnesses, to all of you, uh, thank you for being here today. I look forward to hearing your stories. Uh, many of you have been in my office. You've met. You've pushed uh, this issue. You've, uh, you've been in the media. Uh, you've been active participants in improving the lives of our veterans. And for that, I am grateful. Uh, I can tell you, though, it, it's always with heavy heart. I vividly remember the testimonies that we've had on this subject before. Uh, family members of Daniel Somers, Clay Hunt, and Brian Portwine, who were here in 2014. These testimonies were difficult to deliver, hard to hear, but integral to the advancement and passage of legislation to address and prevent veteran suicide, the Clay Hunt Save Act. The strength of these families to come forward and share their intimate stories of loss is evidence of the care, compassion, and community that saturates the veterans population. I particularly want to recognize in this forum the heroic role military spouses play. Life is not easy as a military spouse to begin with, but to be called on to get up every day and recommit to the best interests of a spouse struggling with the effects of post-traumatic stress is profoundly heroic and a challenge too often conducted in isolation. So today we want to make sure we honor those heroes in our efforts to save lives. It is this care, compassion, and community that must be leveraged by the VA to ensure veterans have access to the support they need while recovering, as the chairman so rightfully said, with a, uh, a, a future uh, of healing, a future of moving forward. The Clay Hunt Save Act required the VA to look internally at ways to increase access to mental health care for veterans and externally at ways to increase the community's presence in how this mental health is delivered. The Clay Hunt Save Act also mandated the VA begin to collect data on mental health care to aid in future improvements and discussions such as this one. While we wait on the delivery of that data in 2018, we can rely on the VA's reporting of 20 veterans' lives lost to a suicide every day to tell us we have work to do. 20 veterans who didn't receive the support they needed in a way that could accept, process, and apply. Before me are four veterans that refused to become a statistic. They refused to become a, a casualty of war. And after surviving both combat and PTS, these veterans decided to continue fighting on behalf of fellow veterans. I appreciate the time each of you has taken to testify today, and I look forward to a discussion that will support further advancements in the treatment of veterans' mental health. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to your testimony. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Walls. Our first uh, uh, panelist is Brendan O'Byrne, a veteran of, of the United States Army. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Sebastian Younger, I came prepared, brought the book. Uh, journalist, filmmaker, and author of many notable works, including the recent book, Tribe on Homecoming and Belonging. I recommend you read that. Uh, Zach Icecall, the executive director of Headstrong, uh, Headstrong Project and a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Welcome. Uh, uh, Paul Downs, a member of the Boulder Crest Retreat Team and a veteran of the United States Marine Corps who is testifying on behalf of the David Lynch Foundation's Operation Warrior Wellness Initiative. Welcome. And Dr. Harold Cudler, the Acting Assistant Deputy Undersecretary for Patient Care Services for the Veterans Health Administration of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, who is accompanied by Brad Floor, Senior Advisor at the Veterans Benefits Administration. Welcome, uh, you all also. Thank you for being here this morning. Mr. Byrne, you're recognized for five minutes. Hello, thank you for allowing me to share my story. My name is Brendan O'Byrne. I served in the military from 2002 to 2008. In May of 2007, I was deployed to the Korangal Valley, Afghanistan, and completed a 15-month tour as a sergeant team leader with the Airborne Infantry. When my unit and I redeployed back home, I did not expect to have any issues from the deployment, but I was wrong. I began to have various symptoms of PTSD upon returning from combat. When I was honorably discharged in December 2008, I began to seek help from the VA to deal with the PTSD I had. At the time, I was unemployable, barely able to function in a healthy way, so I applied for disability, PTSD disability. After a four-year back and forth of the VA, I was given a 70% disability rating. Almost immediately, I was told by other veterans and even some workers at the VA that I should fight for 
my 100%. <clears throat> now, I don't know if they saw something that I didn't, but in my eyes, I was not 100% disabled, and I told them that. The common response was, you deserve 100%, you earned it. I take offense to these two statements because I fail to see how I deserve or earned a disability rating. I have PTSD, a treat treatable disorder. I did not lose a limb or sustain any permanent physical damage. A PTSD disability rating is not a handout, it's a tool. I used the mon money as a tool. I didn't have to worry about my rent or bills. I could focus squarely on the PTSD symptoms and fix them. I did the work, working through the crippling anxiety, blinding anger, and a slurry of other symptoms. Because of that hard work, today I know I am no longer 70% disabled. Recently, I've been working on the steps to lower my rating. Surprisingly, I have received a lot of pushback. The pushback has come from well-intentioned VA workers, other veterans, family and friends, all singing the same chorus, you deserve it, you earned it. What I have to ask is this, if our goal is not to get the veterans off disability and to become active, contributing members of society, then what is our goal? To me, being an active member of society is the ultimate sign of healing from combat and we should all should be striving for it. On my journey back home, I have tried all forms of treatment, from VA counseling to a service dog. My first concentrated effort was through the VA, signing myself into a 45-day inpatient PTSD treatment facility eight months after separating from the Army. While there, I learned many of the mechanics of PTSD, like the triggers of, of PTSD symptoms and ways to deal with them or avoid them. Every day, we would have group counseling sessions. Sometimes I would hear varying stories of trauma, from combat in Vietnam jungles to the streets of Iraq. But more than those traumatic stories, I heard stories that sounded a lot like bad day rather than a traumatic moment. As weeks went by, I realized the sad truth about a por portion of the veterans there. They were scammers, seeking a higher rating without a real trauma. This was proven when I heard, overheard one vet say to another that he had to pay his bills and how he was hoping this inpatient was enough for a 100% rating. I vowed to never participate in group counseling through the VA again. When there is money to gain, there will be fraud. The VA is no different. Veterans are no different. In the noble efforts to help veterans and clear the backlog of VA claims, we allowed a lot of fraud into the system and it is pushing away the veterans with real trauma and real PTSD. Since returning home in 2008, I have given speeches all across the country about my struggles with PTSD and talked to thousands of veterans seeking the answers about healing from combat. The trend I've seen among the combat veterans, the most traumatized group, is that they stay away from the VA, or at the very least, the group counseling set settings. They have no patience for the fraudulent veterans scamming the system to get a paycheck, and they are definitely not gonna open up about their worst days to those who know nothing about them. The problem is this, when we talk about healing from PTSD, I consider the most effective form of therapy peer-to-peer -peer counseling, especially older vets mixed with younger vets. An easier way to understand the power of peer-to-peer -peer counseling is looking at a Alcoholics Anonymous. In AA, there is no clinicians, no experts, and no money to gain by going to meetings. The only reward is getting sober. Being an alcoholic myself, I did not turn to the doctors or psychologists to stop drinking. I turned to AA and the people who understood my plight through their own experiences, and I'm close to four years sober now. Veterans are the same in the, that we know how to take care of one another, but with the fraudulent PTSD claims in the clinical setting of the VA, it is hard for veterans to really open up about the worst days of their life. Where to go, though, if not the VA? Last year, I was a co-facilitator co of the Tr From Troy to Baghdad program run and funded by the New Hampshire Humanities. With a group of eight veterans, four Vietnam and four Iraq and Afghanistan, we read and discussed the Odyssey by Homer. We met once a week for two hours for 12 weeks. During those 12 weeks, I witnessed something I consider holy. Older veterans and younger veterans hashing out the experience of war and homecoming. The old teaching the young and, the, and vice versa. The amount of healing that was accomplished in that room is hard to describe. We talked about God, about death, about life, about the feeling of returning to home to a country you no longer recognize as home. We talked about suicide, about anger, about hate. We talked about fate, bravery, and combat in that home. And in those 12 weeks, I learned more about home, war, war and homecoming than I had in all the VA counseling I received in the years of being home. These are the conversations that bring veterans home and they desperately need to be fostered in the ways that promote the conversations that happen, happen organically. Around the country, small nonprofits designed to serve veterans are springing up. Some of these nonprofits that have done an immense amount of, to heal vets. Some that I think are doing really great work are Outward Bound for Veterans, Heroes and Horses, Team Rubicon, and Team Red, White, and Blue. 
Though each of these nonprofits are vastly different from one another, the one universal is that these groups empower veterans. They show veterans that they are not broken, that they can heal from these experiences and do great things in the world after war. When I come back to the question I asked in the beginning, what is our goal for our veterans' futures? Programs like the ones I just mentioned are helping reincorporate veterans to, act, to be active members of society. I encourage more support for these programs. Thank you, Mr. O'Byrne. Mr. Younger, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. It's an honor to speak here today. Although every mission of service is crucial in our military, only about 10% of soldiers experience sustained combat. And yet, by some estimates, 25% suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Even the lowest estimates of long-term PTSD are, are higher than the total number of troops in combat. Humans have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to survive and even thrive despite extreme violence and hardship. And if a quarter of our ancestors were psychologically incapacitated by trauma, the human race would have died out long ago. Many of our vets seem to be suffering from something other than a reaction to trauma. One possible explanation for their psychological troubles is that, whether they experience combat or not, transitioning from the close communal life of a platoon to the alienation of modern society is extremely difficult. 25% of Peace Corps volunteers struggle with depression when they return from service overseas. Humans evolved to live in small groups where survival depended on being tightly bonded to those around us. We did not evolve to live alone or in single family units that were independent from the wider community. Ironically, when you collapse modern society, excuse me, uh, ironically, when you collapse modern society, such as during the London Blitz or the attacks of 9 11, there is often an improvement in mental health. Suicide rates in New York City dropped after 9 11. It is thought that the instinctive communalism of a crisis actually buffers people from suicide and depression. As one English official observed during the Blitz, the chronic neurotics of peacetime are now driving ambulances. Interestingly, PTSD is virtually unheard of among Afghan and Iraqi fighters, and the Israeli military reportedly has a PTSD rate as low as 1%. All of these societies enjoy both widespread military service and exceedingly tight community bonds. Furthermore, none of these societies incentivize veterans to see themselves as permanently damaged wards of the state. In an attempt to reach more people, the VA allowed veterans to both self-diagnose PTSD and exempted them from having to cite any traumatizing incident during the war. As a result, the percentage of global war on terror vets on PTSD disability seems so high that the VA appears unwilling to release the figure. I've tried for two years to get that figure without success. Even highly placed administrators within the VA eventually gave up after trying to help me. Obviously, a small number of combat vets will experience long-term trauma reactions and need full disability payments. A larger number of combat vets will need temporary financial support while they undergo counseling and dedicate themselves to rejoining the workforce. But if you want to create hundreds of thousands of depressed alcoholics in our society, give them just enough money to never have to work again, and tell them they are too disabled to contribute to society in any meaningful way. In the civilian population, which does not have access to lifelong PTSD disability, trauma reaction is considered both treatable and temporary. It would be interesting to see how the survivors of the Deepwater Horizon disaster are faring, or the survivors of Hurricane Katrina, or the survivors of a town that was hit by a tornado. Surely the vast majority of these people have resumed productive lives despite having been deeply affected by the trauma they survived. We are not doing veterans a favor by warehousing them in a lifelong entitlement program. I would like to make one further point in order for soldiers to avoid something called moral injury, they have to believe they are fighting for a just cause. And that just cause can only reside in a nation that truly believes in itself as an enduring entity. When it became fashionable after the election for some of my fellow Democrats to declare that Donald Trump was, quote, not their president, they put all of our soldiers at risk of moral injury. 
And when Donald Trump charged repeatedly that Barack Obama, the commander in chief, was not even an American citizen, he surely demoralized many soldiers who were fighting under orders from that White House. For the sake of our military personnel, if not for the sake of our democracy, such statements should be quickly and forcefully repudiated by the offending political party. If that is no longer realistic, at least this committee, which is charged with overseeing the welfare of our servicemen and women, should issue a bipartisan statement rejecting such rhetorical attacks on our national unity. That unity is all soldiers have when they face the enemy, and you must do everything in your power to make sure it is not taken from them. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. And now, Mr. Iskold, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all for having me here today. It's an honor to be here before Congress. Um, many great things begin in a bar, including my beloved Marine Corps, uh, as did the Headstrong Project. Uh, in 2012, I was catching up with my former battalion commander, a guy named Colonel Willie Buell. Uh, about 10 years after the Second Battle of Fallujah. During that fight, we lost 33 Marines in combat. Half the battalion, 500 men were wounded. And Colonel Buell remarked to me that he was worried that we would soon lose more Marines to suicide than we had to enemy action. Today, that count stands at 23 Marines lost to suicide. For us at Headstrong, this work is deeply personal. Two days later, I relay, uh, relayed that story to two very successful investors in New York City, uh, very successful finance guys, and one of them remarked to me that he didn't understand why he could see one of the top psychiatrists in New York City tomorrow morning without private insurance, without a wait time, um, I'm sorry, regardless of rate time, schedule, or insurance, and he asked a simple question, why can't we do the same for our veterans? That became the founding mission of Headstrong Project. Within months, we raised a small amount of money, formed a partnership with Wild Cornell Medicine to treat Iraq and Afghanistan veterans in New York City. Since then, we've provided over 5,500 clinical sessions, grown to almost 200 active clients, and have expanded our treatment program outside of New York City to San Diego, Houston, Chicago, Washington, DC, through a network of over 80 world-class private practice providers. More importantly, we have not had a single suicide. Prior to our expansion efforts, we ex intentionally grew slowly to ensure that our model was effective. Among the 47,000 veteran service organizations in our country, there's no shortage of goodwill, but there's also no shortage of half-baked ideas, ineffective awareness campaigns, or fundraising efforts without a foundation of solid programming. For us, it was critically important that we build a program that actually works. We'll be opening in Denver and Colorado Springs within a month and received a grant from the New York State Health Foundation to begin providing care to veterans in rural areas of New York State. Our model is simple, effective, and highly efficient. On average, it costs less than $5,000 to treat one veteran and $250,000 to expand to a new market. All treatment is tailored to the needs of the individual and managed by our team at Wild Cornell Medicine. We do not limit the number of sessions and we do not believe that there's a panacea for treating post-traumatic stress. In New York City, all care is provided at Wild Cornell. In other locations, what we've done is we've built a network of top psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers to provide care. Instead of build, spending millions to build brick and mortar clinics that are often staffed by inexperienced recent graduates, we tap into the capacity of the private market to provide care. These are the same doctors that members of this committee uh, would send their loved ones to should God forbid they need it. These clinicians must meet a very high standard of experience, training, and qualifications and they're also vetted, interviewed, and managed by our team at Wild Cornell. We then pay these clinicians to provide care. In return, we require that they submit their notes to our team at Cornell and that they participate in case conferences to ensure that we have accountability of outcomes. Uh, we provide a variety of evidence-based treatments, including EMDR, cognitive behavioral therapy, drug and alcohol treatment, group therapy, and spouse and family support. When a veteran reaches out to us, we're in touch with them almost immediately. We say on our website within 48 hours, it's usually within hours. They then do a call with one of our clinicians who finds out why they are reaching out to us, what the issue is, uh, and we do not require any paperwork, insurance, uh, or, and provide care regardless of type of military discharge. After their phone intake, that client then meets with a psychiatrist MD to do an initial uh, session, one or two sessions. We get an initial diagnosis. We ensure that they're a good fit for outpatient care, and then we plug them into uh, a 
individually tailored treatment program uh, that not only includes evidence-based treatment, but could include substance abuse treatment, group therapy, and non-clinical activities like yoga, rock climbing, kayaking, and other sports and mind-body techniques. While undergoing the treatment, our team at Cornell closely monitors in the veteran's progress to make sure to make adjustments to care and to ensure our client is getting better. This work is not done in a vacuum, but is in coordination with the client and their clinical team. And while this might seem expensive, it's very efficient, and as I said, I said the numbers earlier. Um, in the uh, documents that I submitted, I showed some of the outcomes that we have in terms of improved sleep, reduced hypervigilance, reduction in avoidance, reduction in suicide ideation, improved mood, improved work at school, reduction in drug and alcohol use, and reduction in the use of medication and symptoms that you can see. And I would state uh, that those numbers are probably two to three high times higher than any other clinical program. I'm also proud to say that our number one source of referrals is veterans referring other veterans to our program. We have a great relationship with some VA hospitals in cities like San Diego and Houston, less so with others as referral partners. Um, and most importantly, I think uh, in the special operations community, we adhere to five what we call the soft truths, that humans are more important than hardware, that quality is better than quantity, that special operations forces cannot be mass produced, that competent special operations forces cannot be created after emergencies occur, and that most special operations require non-soft assistance. And I believe that these soft truths are equally important when you're talking about providing credible and effective mental health care to our nation's veterans, and that these truths are the backbone of what makes Headstrong work so effective. There's no simple app that will solve this problem. Instead, it requires talented and dedicated human beings. I cannot emphasize enough that the quality of the providers matters immensely and you cannot produce these great clinicians overnight or after a national emergency like the current suicide epidemic. I would add that this human factor extends to the veterans we treat as well. Our medical director and co-founder, Dr. Ann Beter, a leading trauma and substance abuse psychiatrist and professor of medicine at Weill Cornell, has also often remarked that in her 30-year career treating uh, people with mental health issues, Veterans represent the base pe best patients she has had the honor of working with. They are goal-oriented, hardworking, and follow the doctor's orders. Remarkably, once they start getting better, they look for ways to continue to serve and give back. And I'll just tell one anecdote. Often a veteran will reach out to us, usually a SEAL, a Ranger, or a Marine, and they'll want insurance, assurances that our program is completely confidential. They'll say, you know, I'm reaching out. My spouse says that if I don't get help, she's going to leave me. It's the only reason I'm coming here, but I want to make sure nobody knows that I'm going to get help. And after a few sessions, that SEAL Ranger or Marine is starting to sleep through the night. Their anxiety and panic attacks go away. They're no longer self-medicating. And after about five or six months, they're much better. And then they won't shut up about the treatment program. <laughs> they want all of their friends to know about it. They become ambassadors to our program because treatment works. And what Mr. O'Byrne said, about doing the hard work and that PTSD is treatable, more veterans need to hear those words. In my own journey, I've learned that one of the biggest barriers to care is that many do not recognize mental health care as real medicine. And I'm not talking about drugs or pharmaceuticals, but the hard work that goes into that healing and repairing the effects of combat and moral injury on our brain and nervous systems. Hidden wounds can be healed. At Headstrong, we firmly believe that if you have the courage to get help and you get the right help, you can recover and get back to the best version of yourself. Our job at Headstrong is to make sure people are getting the right help. And our clients will tell you this takes hard work, but is worth all the effort. Thank you for your time and for having us here today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Downs, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rowe, um, Ranking Member Waltz, and other distinguished members of the Veterans Affairs Committee for this opportunity. Uh, to speak with you today, to tell you my story, and to bear witness for a powerful technique for healing and wellness, uh, Transcendental Meditation. My name is Paul Downs, and I served 11 years in the United States Marine Corps as an infantryman. I was deployed a number of times. When I left the Marines, I realized that I would be closer to my young children, but what I didn't realize was just how much my identity as a Marine meant to me. When I left the Corps, I lost my tribe, I lost my sense of self, and I lost all that I knew to be true. I lost my sense of forward momentum, purpose, and connection. What caught up with me weren't just the nightmares relating to my deployments. It was all the traumas that I carried into the Marine Corps. Like many of my brothers and sisters, my first experience with combat wasn't karma or Fallujah. It was the hallways of my, my own house as a child. 
a place that should have been safe but was instead an active war zone. The Marine Corps, in actuality, saved my life for a time. When my service was done, I sought help from the VA. I saw guidance, and direction, and connection. And instead, I got apathy, diagnoses, and denials. So I quit trying. Why would I add that level of stress to the struggle that I was already neck deep in? I suffered from post-traumatic stress, and to many outside observers, might have seemed like an angry, disgruntled veteran. The fear and sadness was drowning me. And after a few months of putting away the uniform, I developed a pretty detailed plan for suicide. I was about as close as you could come to becoming a statistic. I was sitting in my truck, ready to proceed with the plan, and the thought hit me that to die by my own hand is not my birthright. This is not it, and this is not to be my end. It can't be, and it is not the way of the warrior. Warriors have a deep appreciation for life and are not victims of circumstance. I called the executive director of Boulder Crest Retreat and I said I need something new in order to live because if I don't, I'm certain to die. That something was the Warrior Path program. It's an immersive program where veterans rely on the support, the company, and the experience of our peers. The program was created by combat veterans for combat veterans. And during the program, many modalities allowed me to face my deep struggle and grow to profound strength. I was able to claim a new and positive diagnosis of post-traumatic growth. The modality that most made this change possible was Transcendental Meditation. It's a simple to learn, easy technique taught by a fellow combat veteran. I took comfort in knowing how evidence-based TM is, and I could cite um, all the research that demonstrates its promise and its power uh, 340 peer-reviewed studies, National Institute of Health Research showing substantial reductions in heart disease, massive dis decrease in symptoms of post-traumatic stress, depression, and insomnia, but I'm not a public health expert, so I'd rather just tell you how it helped me. After just a few weeks of practicing this meditation for 20 minutes, twice a day, I felt less anxious, less angry, more focused, more energized, more directed. I'd found purpose again. I gained a connection to self that I didn't have before. I had severed it in order to survive. And surviving wasn't my birthright anymore, thriving was. I found peace with my past and I realized who I am and there's no pill for that. Because of that connection to self, I now find myself as a warrior path guide at Boulder Crest Retreat. I get to walk with my brothers and sisters on their path from struggle to strength. There were many activities that we engaged in at the retreat, but many of them don't apply to everyday post-retreat life. TM is different. I can meditate on an airplane. I can meditate in traffic. I don't close my eyes, but I do use the mantra. And that's why TM is so pivotal. You can take it anywhere. And it can be done at any time. And perhaps that's why it has so many other applications, such as classrooms filled with at-risk children, or for women and children dealing with the after effects of intimate partner violence. What I've come to realize is that I needed this training, training to learn how to regulate so I could be as calm, cool, and collected at home as I was on the battlefield. We have to be trained to be present and connected, and it's hard to believe that 20 minutes twice a day is exactly what we require. But it is. It worked for me and for thousands of my brothers and sisters. It's given me the opportunity not just to survive, but to, but to thrive, and to live a life that's truly full of purpose, meaning, connection, and service. And for that, I want to thank the David Lynch Foundation and their outstanding Operation Warrior Wellness Division, which makes TM available to veterans overcoming post-traumatic stress and the families who support them. They gave me a gift that changed my life, the lives of my family, and the lives of everyone I come into contact with. I'm grateful that they have also been there for many others. And in 2016 alone, veterans in active duty military from 38 states have learned TM from specially trained teachers and get to experience its impact. As you reflect on the changes that are needed in the VA, I would ask that you provide more platforms for the voices of others like me, voices that often get lost in our decisions to find solutions. Those who have been there and done that on the battlefield and in the depths of despair. The one thing that will never change is that we veterans know what one another need. Thank you for your time and attention and for the honor of addressing you today. 
Thank you, Mr. Downs. I may have to have you teach me that before my next town hall that I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Cuddle, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, good morning, Chairman Rowe, uh, Ranking Member Waltz, and members of the committee. And thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Department of Veterans Affairs mental health services that promote recovery from post-traumatic stress disorder and support veteran wellness. I'm accompanied by Brad Floor, uh, Senior Advisor for Compensation Service Veterans Benefits Administration. VA is committed to providing timely access to quality evidence-based mental health care that anticipates and responds to veterans' needs, advances their recovery, and supports reintegration into their communities. In fiscal year 2016, more than 1.6 million veterans received treatment in a VA mental health specialty program. From 2007 to 2017, the number of veterans receiving disability uh, compensation increased 190%. The continuum of PTSD care includes mental health providers based in primary care mental health clinics, behavioral health integration teams, uh, specialized residential rehabilitation treatment programs, and PTSD outpatient clinical teams. Nationwide, VA operates 131 PTSD clinical teams, each of which has a staff member trained to treat veterans with PTSD and concurrent substance use disorders. VA recognizes that PTSD has varied and complex symptom presentations, and they require a nuanced approach. This was the rationale for creating the Center for Compassion and Innovation, which offers options when traditional evidence-based treatments do not meet veterans' needs. VA's National Center for PTSD is the world's leading resource for PTSD treatment, research, and education. Uh, it provides assessment tools and treatment manuals, online training, smartphone apps on its uh, award-winning uh, website, ptsd.va.gov. An important new research initiative is the Leahy Friedman National PTSD Brain Bank, the first repository dedicated to understanding how psychological trauma and biological systems interact to create anatomical and functional changes in brain tissue. Recent VA research finds that 20 veterans die by suicide each day, and veterans must receive assistance where and when they need it. To do this, we've developed the largest integrated suicide prevention program in the country, with over 1,100 employees specifically dedicated to suicide prevention and veteran engagement. VA has also fielded the groundbreaking ReachVet program, which uses a new predictive model to analyze data from millions of veterans' health records to identify those at statistically elevated risk for suicide, as well as other adverse outcomes. This allows VA to provide preemptive, enhanced care to lessen the risks for those before those challenges become crises. The number of veterans receiving mental health care from VA is growing three times faster than the overall number of VA users. This reflects VA's concerted effort to engage veterans who are new to our system and to enhance access to mental health services for enrolled veterans. It's also a reflection of the elimination of barriers to seeking mental health care by reducing the stigma associated with it. VA is committed to working with public and private partners to ensure that no matter where a veteran lives, he or she can access quality, timely mental health care. As of April 2017, there were almost 1,100 peer specialists engaged, engaging veterans at VA MCs and community-based outpatient clinics. Certified peer specialists are veterans in recovery from mental health conditions who provide understanding, support, and advocacy. Crisis intervention and suicide prevention are skills peer specialists apply from the first moment they meet veterans. Peers who have recovered from mental health conditions, including many who have survived suicidal ideation and attempts, are living proof to veterans that there is hope for recovery and a quality life. Vet centers provide free readjustment counseling uh, for veterans who served in combat and offer a wide range of social and psychological services to veterans, active duty service members, and their families. This includes individual and group uh, counseling as well as family and bereavement counseling. In 2015, vet centers provided more than 228,000 individuals and families with over 1,664,000 visits. Vet centers are non-medical facilities, but they refer veterans to VA outpatient mental health care when that would facilitate successful readjustment to civilian life. We know that 14 of the 20 veterans who die uh, on average by, uh, by suicide every day do not receive mental health care within VA. 
And one current barrier to that care is having an other than honorable administrative discharge. Driven by the need to reduce the number of suicides and treat mental illness in at-risk populations, VA is expanding provisions to urgent mental health care needs to other than honorably discharged veterans by using existing legal authorities. Treating, VA is a top VA, uh, treating PTSD is a top VA priority. We remain focused on providing high quality care uh, for veterans because they've earned it and they do deserve it. And our nation trusts us to provide it. We appreciate the support of Congress in doing this and look forward to responding to any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Keller. I'm, uh, first of all, thank the entire panel. You all was very informative and, and I appreciate you taking the time to prepare. I'm gonna hold my question till the end and I'll now yield to Mr. Kaufman for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, from, let me ask the uh, question uh, to the VA first in that uh, what percentage of those who have been assessed as, as disabled uh, uh, by the Veterans Administration uh, are participating in treatment? The way I look at those numbers, it ought to be about half. There are about 930,000 veterans who have been uh, assigned uh, disability for PTSD, and uh, we saw 453,000 of them uh, last year. But your number, 453,000, <clears> that, could, that could include a, a good deal of veterans who have not been, who have complained about symptoms related to post-traumatic stress, but have not been uh, um, assigned a percentage in terms of disability, is that correct? Or do you track them according, uh, do, you, do you bifurcate those numbers as to those who have been uh, uh, given a percentage of disability, a disability award? Uh, by the VA versus those who have not? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to get you a breakdown of that. I would that. like that breakdown. But again, there are 932,000 right. veterans who are service-connected for PTSD, yeah. and we've seen 453,000. I, I would like to there. get that breakdown. And I wonder, if, uh, for, the, for the veterans uh, representing groups, could you, um, uh, in your view, uh, number one, is the, the response from the, from the VA in terms of treating PTSD uh, too drug-centric uh, in terms of the modality of treatment? And number two, in your view, uh, if given the proper modalities of treatment, is PTSD can it be brought down to a level where it's no longer debilitating? Um, let's see. Uh, so, well, let's go uh, uh, right to left. You're right. Uh, I, I do believe the, the VA is, is too pill-centric. I mean, I, I think that our, our country is too pill-centric, but, um, uh, you know, when you have a, a, a pill that says on the bottle may cause further suicidal thoughts or homicidal thoughts, maybe you shouldn't be going home with those pills for a person that's already suicidal or depressed. Um, I think that that right there is a, it should be addressed. And, and I do believe that, that with time, uh, PTSD is, you know, all symptoms, uh, you're never gonna be the same from combat, but the symptoms of PTSD with time and work do go away. Uh, it just takes time, work, and a, a concentrated effort in, in dealing with these things. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, first, thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Um, I think that what I would say about the, the first part of your question is that I can't answer as a clinician, and that there are times where pills are very important, and I would never recommend to anybody to quit them cold turkey. That's just a bad idea. Um, the second half, uh, I think that when you compare uh, the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder to the way that we were trained to react in combat, they're almost exactly the same. So when you look at that and you tell us that, that you're training us to be strong in, in, this, in this wartime environment, and these are strengths that we need, and then when we get out, you tell us that those exact same strengths are now weaknesses. I think that the first step is to recognize that if they were strengths then, then they're strengths now. And that if we can say, here's how you take these strengths and use them in this area of gray, which when we're in combat, it's black and white, it's pure, we get it. But when we come back, there's a whole lot of gray that gets introduced. And if we can use those strengths that we were trained for in, the, in, in whatever branch of service we're in, in everyday life, how do I use it at home? I think that that, uh, 
That's pivotal. Mm. Um, on the uh, first question, um, does the VA prescribe too many, too many drugs and pharmaceuticals? I think if you've been to one VA, you've been to one VA. And if you've been to one doctor, you've been to one doctor. And it varies uh, greatly between the different VAs that we work with. Some of the VAs we work with have a great relationship with our doctors at Weill Cornell Medicine, where the team at Weill Cornell will actually adjust the pharmaceuticals that patients are on. And the VA is very open to that. Some cases, not so much. Um, in terms of the modalities, I think there are some modalities that work better than others, but they require intensive treatment and supervision, uh, like EMDR. Um, that is one of two approved therapies by the VA uh, Center for Post-Traumatic Stress, the other being cognitive behavioral therapy. And so there are real challenges on training qualified clinicians in EMDR outside of the private market. And then in terms of PTSD being treatable, um, as I mentioned in my remarks, on average, most of our clients are asymptomatic within five to six months. We also have some patients that have been in treatment for two plus years. And I think one of the important things to understand about treating mental health care is it's not like treating a broken arm. If Congressman, if you and I both had a broken arm, 99% of the time the treatment is the same, we get a cast. Uh, when you're treating mental illness, you're dealing with not just necessarily the combat trauma somebody's experienced, but oftentimes lifelong trauma, different proclivities for substance abuse, a variety of different issues uh, in their personal lives. And so what we have found works is a patient-centered model. Um, and I don't think you can design, <clears throat> excuse me, a one-size-fits-all approach um, for mental health care. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Appreciate the gentleman yielding. Mr. Walsh, you recognize for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for compelling and uh, thoughtful uh, testimony. And, and Mr. Downs, I am, I am certainly glad you're here to testify. As I said earlier, I've, uh, I've become good friends with Daniel Sommer's parents. I wish I'd have been able to become good friends with him. Um, I'm sure your parents are good folks, but I'm certainly glad you're the one that's testifying. And so this speaks volumes to your resiliency. And I, I think something I've said since I've been here as a veteran myself, and I think it irritates many of us, veterans are not victims. I heard each of you say that. We are not victims, uh, nor are we damaged. Um, we, we need, in some cases, to be repaired. Uh, we need to refit and then get back to whatever we're doing. And uh, I think that attitude itself is, is, is uh, so helpful, and I think you're bringing a broad spectrum. Uh, Mr. Isco, I thought, uh, again, I appreciate your talk on this. It's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. We need to understand what's there. I struggle some um, with our desire to make sure we're evidence-based. But I fall into the camp that if a veteran tells me it works for him, then let's use it. Um, this is where uh, across the spectrum of, of different treatments. So. Uh, if I could ask, Mr. Ritzel, so you, you had some in interesting things here. How, does, uh, how are you able to ensure that, that folks are getting accurately diagnosed? And then, then in kind of segueing from that, how do you contain costs uh, in this? That, that shouldn't be our number one concern, but uh, it's something you're able to do that I think could be applied. Um, yeah, if I may call you Sergeant Major. <laughs> Thanks. It's a promotion from this job. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, well, Sergeant Major, um, I think it's a great question. The way that we uh, may contain costs, um, and I'll start with that, is it really comes down to the team at Wild Cornell. We have three psychiatrists or world-class psychiatrists. We have a team of about 10 clinicians at Cornell who manage the care. And so we then do assessments at 4, 8, 12, and periodically of, um, that measure the quality of life of the people that are in our program, measuring their sleep quality, their anxiety, their drug use, whether or not they're getting better in their day-to-day -day life. Um, and, uh, and that's not a complicated assessment that, that we run. Um, and if the care is not working, we modify it and change it. And I think that's, uh, that's critically important in managing um, the costs. Um, uh, and I've, I'm sorry, I forgot the other part of your question. Just the diagnosis on, on, on are we misdiagnosing? And, and I think it goes back to Mr. Yeah. O'Byrne's point on this of, of diagnosing everyone. Are we getting that right? Is that causing complications? So, so I think the diagnosis matters less to us than the goals. Uh, when a veteran reaches out to us, the first thing we want to know is why. Uh, is it because of relationship with their spouse? Is it because they can't sleep to the night? Is it because they're self-medicating, anxiety, a work-related issue? And we really focus on treating that. Um, and so whether or not it's post-traumatic stress, depression, uh, some sort of other disorder matters less than understanding what the, the life goals are. 
No, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Junger, thank you again. I, I appreciate your activism in this. I, uh, in full disclosure, as a cultural geographer, my first teaching job was on Pine Ridge. I'm drawn to your, uh, your analogies and, and the sense of this. My question to you is, 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 is and I fully, I think I fall fully into your thinking on this, the reintegration and how we do that. The trouble I have is, is that we have a new phenomenon here where we have a lot of female warriors that when they come back, they don't get that same sense of integration. They're driving their truck with a veteran plate on it and someone asks them if it's their husband's truck. Those are not anecdotal. Those really do happen. You have any research or any of your insights into this that how do we reintegrate our female warriors into, into that culture and that communal healing? Uh, thank you for the question, and I wish I could speak more to it. Um, the unit that I was with in Afghanistan, that's where I met uh, Brendan O'Byrne, was an all-male unit. Um, my book, Tribe, really is not about PTSD or, or soldiers. It's about um, the consequences of losing community in a modern nation. And one of the consequences is that people who have suffered trauma, uh, they're, they're not aided in their recovery by the close support of others around them. Um, I, uh, the, the specific gender issue, uh, the, um, the issue of the public seeing a woman in a, in a truck with veteran plates and thinking it's her husband's, I, I mean, that's a public relations campaign, I think. Um, I, I'm not sure it goes to the sort of deep psychological work that this, this committee is going to have to pursue and understand. But I may be wrong. I mean, I really haven't re done research. I just on wonder that. what community they belong to when they come back. That's the one that, that well, I struggle with. Well, ideally, they belong to the community that they left before they served. And, th and that's the problem, is that in a modern society, I'm not just picking on America, and there's a lot of statistics to back this up, as modernity goes up, as wealth goes up in a society, the suicide rate goes up, the depression rate goes up, the schizophrenia rate goes up. The, the reason is that we know many people no longer live in close communities, and that's true of female veterans as well, unfortunately. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Dr. Winstrup, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your insights today. It's tremendously helpful to us. I was taken by many things, as I think we all have been today. Uh, one, the comment about moral injury, and if it's not a just cause, and the lack of national unity. And I think that is something that people um, come home and struggle with. You know, I served under presidents of both parties, and it didn't matter. That's not what it's all about. But when you come home and that same type of feeling is not there, it's hurtful. But the feeling necessary, that's the one that hit me the most. When I think of my time when I come home as a doctor, uh, spending a year in theater, I saw trauma I've never seen the likes of before. Um, I wasn't used to being attacked three or four times a week. That's not normal but I did feel necessary. And when I came home and I was told, well, you have 90 days before you go back to work, I said, I'm going next week. I'm not, what am I supposed to do? Sit around my house? This is, this is damaging to us. And so I appreciate so much about the talk about community as a core and, the, uh, and needing to feel necessary. So we sit on this committee and I'm on economic opportunity and on health and economic opportunity and all the issues we're facing, it seems like in the VA, we're being reactive rather than proactive. And the proactive part needs to really come in play while you're still in uniform. I mean, I'd like to ask each of you, would you feel differently if when you hung up that uniform, you knew exactly where you were gonna be in two weeks with a job or in school and, and part of something, part of a community where somebody needs you would that make the difference compared to getting out and then wondering what's next as opposed to having it said? I look at the college graduate who gets their degree and already knows where they're going to be working. That's far different than one that gets their degree and doesn't know what lies ahead. And I'd love to hear your comments, and it plays into what Mr. Younger's written about. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wentz, for this good question. And uh, in answer to that, I think about when I got out in September of 2014. September 11, actually. Um, when I got out, I, I was an E5 in the Marine Corps, and I had just gotten looked at for, for, e, for E6. I'd been in for 11 years, and I was on top of my game. I loved every bit of it. Um, I picked up a 100K contracting job at the exact same place where I was working. I was going to school. I was doing everything. And on the outside, you would look at me, and you would assume that everything was good. And a month after that, I, was, I had a plan. I, was, I had a plan to kill myself. So I think just having a place to go isn't necessarily good enough. 
I think that we can go anywhere as long as we know that we can go anywhere. That it's not the anywhere that matters, that it's us that makes the difference. So if I'm connected in here, if I'm, if I'm satisfied and, and grateful every morning for waking up, then I can be successful anywhere. And I think that that's key. So how do we parlay that into the transition out of uniform? So I think I'll go back to um, what I talked about uh, earlier, and that's transcendental meditation. And it's just one small practice, and it's one small modality. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to create a space within that I had closed off in order to survive. And I came back from, um, from the Marine Corps, and essentially when I got out, um, Everything that I had used to kind of fuel my success while in the Marine Corps, the stress, the anxiety, uh, the, uh, the adrenaline, the three hours of sleep, didn't apply anymore. I had been told that, that, that all those things were, were not good and, and that I was broken. So when I started uh, Transcendental Meditation, it, it allowed those things that I carried into the Marine Corps and that I experienced during war to process out. These, these thoughts, the traumas, everything started just pouring from me as I continued to practice transcendental meditation. Thank you. Any others care to comment? <clears throat> you know, I, um, I agree with everything he said. And, and also, I also do think that there, um, there is a need for a, some kind of something to be waiting for you at, at home. When I left the military in 2008, 2009, we were in a recession. I mean, I couldn't get a job cleaning floors at Walmart in the middle of the night. I was just leading men in combat, you know, three, four, four months before that. I mean, to, to, have, to go from that to that was incredibly damaging. And, I, you know, I, I believe that um, Ernest Shackleton is one of the best leaders ever. And uh, what he said, he had this one guy that was having a hard time when they were stuck on the ice, you know. And uh, he, they were stuck out there for two years, and he, this one, one guy was saying he just wanted to lay down and die. And um, so what he did, Shackleton did, was he took him to the cook, where the cook had a, a fire burning, and it, it took a lot of time to keep the fire going. They fed it blubber and stuff like that. So the cook was, was wore out. So Shackleton said, cook, go, go take a nap and sleep for forever. And uh, the, he took the guy that was going to lay down and die and put him on the fire. And in an hour, he came back. And the guy, had, the guy that just was laying down and going to die had his socks hung up next to the fire and that he was, he was in a better spirit. He was smiling. And what Shackleton said was that occupation had brought his thoughts back to the ordinary cares of life. And that's true. That's true of, of men stuck on ice. That's true of, of veterans coming home from service. We need to be, we need to feel part of this society. And one of the parts of feeling a part of this society is working for it. Thank you. Thank you for extending Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Mr. Ticano, you're recognized five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Cudler, um, I agree that we need to give uh, veterans access uh, to evidence-based therapies, but I also believe that veterans should have access to complementary and alternative therapies that could help them with PTS. Uh, for many of these, the evidence of efficacy is still inconclusive. <coughs> and more research does need to be done. Uh, the President's FY 2018 budget proposes a 5% cut to VA medical research and an 18% cut to the NIH's budget. How would enactment of these cuts affect VA's research into clinical treatments for mental health, including for PTSD? The reason we have a VA research program is that nobody else does research on the kinds of issues that the panel is talking about today. Without that VA research program, you're not going to see progress that I think this entire panel is calling for. If may, may I just sort of interject just a little bit here. Do you, do, you, do you think the private sector at all would be incentivized to do this sort of research? What the, we've been meeting with the private sector, and we've been having uh, some meetings. Uh, the Bush Institute, for instance, had us meet with a group of 10 leading uh, pharmacological companies. And they told us, frankly, there isn't a lot of profit in, doing, uh, in producing pills for PTSD or looking at new uh, mechanisms uh, to work with. Uh, no, th there really isn't a lot of profit Including in the private sector. Including evaluating all of the alternative, alternative therapies as well. I don't know. I mean, I'm not a businessman, but okay. I'm not aware there's any profit uh, to be gained in doing that. And yet VA needs to do this, and it's part of our mission, so we do it. And we depend on those research dollars to do it. 
Um, it, it, can you comment about the NIH budget, um, the 18% cut, how that might impact? Uh, it's, it's outside my realm. I, okay. I don't mind, I won't. Okay. Um, if, it, if it is estimated that the 19 uh, million dollars in VA research appropriations are needed to keep up with inflation and fund current VA research programs, how does VA justify these cuts in the budget when more funding for research and development of effective PTSD treatments and suicide prevention, the VA Secretary's top clinical priority, are needed? Well, there are lots of priorities in VA. We get a large allotment. There are very difficult choices that need to be made. Are you going to offer this treatment? Uh, for instance, people talk about offering uh, hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Very expensive, uh, equivocal uh, evidence, and yet some people feel it really helps them. But do I not offer medication, and not necessarily even mental health medication, but medication for other problems because I've spent my money here? And it's the same question as do we do this research? Do we create this new clinical-based outpatient clinic in this community that doesn't have one? These are tough questions, uh, and, and they're really too big, I think, to get into uh, it, it, within the, this context. I, I, I get it. Um, Mr. Mr. Younger, um, I, I've heard you speak before in other fora. Um, uh, you described the value to individuals of sharing a mission, and that when it ends, that sense of loss of purpose can have a profound and long-term effect. I'm also, you also draw this example of, uh, of uh, uh, advanced societies uh, with advanced economies, and uh, um, what comes to mind is Emil Durkheim, the sociologist, yeah. and uh, the concept of anomie, uh, moving from traditional societies to modern ones. Yeah. Uh, 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 and uh, Mr. Downs's comment, that uh, it's not just enough to have a place to go to. Um, so interesting intersections of some of the testimony here today. Uh, I might give you just a little moment to kind of respond to some of the thoughts that I'm presenting here. Yeah, I mean, in terms of Mr. Downs' comment, I, th I think uh, he's absolutely right. I mean, without some kind of inner peace, your circumstances around you can't save you. Um, but keep in mind, he's referring to having a job, having a place in a society that itself is fractured and alienated. That's, that's what I was getting at. I yeah. mean, the assumption that economics by itself, uh, just having a place and making the GI possible and would go back to the cancer community and the people, these civilians, as they called it, walking around on the streets that hadn't had cancer would never understand their experience. So the, 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 when soldiers miss war, and there are many that I've talked to who do, and many people have written about it, when cancer survivors miss having cancer, what they're really missing is community. And that, I think those examples should serve to inform us about what is missing in our wider society. I'm sorry, my time is up, but I think we're talking about the everydayness of what we experience versus the intensity of uh, yes. what soldiers experience, and that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Mr. Bost, you recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and gentlemen, thank you for your service, and Mr. Eichelsohl and Mr. Downs, Semper Fi. Um, let me say, if I can, Mr. O'Burn, can you expand a little bit? Because let me tell you, you're the first person I've ever, in all the time of having this job, and I've only had it through a term and a half, that says they want to reduce the amount of benefit that they are receiving, okay? And I understand your argument that it is, and, and I, I believe that you can be healed. I mean, I mean, I do. But how and where do we make that judgment call or where does the VA make that judgment call on individuals? How, how does that happen? Well, as I started the research, it's the same process of getting benefits. Okay. Uh, which is uh, I'll go in front of a, a psychiatrist, psychologist, and go through the same process of saying, um, here are my symptoms and here are, you know, how have I improved, how have I not improved, what's my current um, living status like. Uh, it's, so it's all the same process, really. So as you went through the process of, of uh, you know, when you first got your rating, uh, do you feel like the VA handled that correctly or, or incorrectly at the time? Um, it's hard to say correct or incorrect. You know, I was, I was pretty broken at that, at that time, and uh, so I missed a, a couple of the CMP exams, and, um, and I, I felt at the time it was unfair, but I'm not sure if I, I feel the same way now. 
Uh, it was just, it's sort of the process that you have to go through. It, you have to be vetted. And what I talked about with some of the fraud, that has to happen, right? Because there's, there's veterans that, that uh, you know. How we stop it. You see what I'm saying? Because, because I don't want, or maybe. Yeah, if, uh, if I may. Um, so at Headstrong, we don't require any proof of military service. We don't require any paperwork um, at all. Um, <clears throat> and if there are people taking advantage of us, our philosophy is that's okay because we have a bigger mission. Um, at the end of the day, the other benefit we have is one of our clients has told us is we don't provide anything but health care. So we don't have that issue of, of benefits. Thank you. Another question I have uh, for Dr. Cuddler. Um, it, what do we use through the VA to show either success or failure uh, as we treat uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome uh, patients in comparison, and, is, and can we do that in comparison to the private sector? Because I know the studies and all of those that have been done, as a matter of fact, they're a very successful one in, in my district is called This Abled Vet, and it, it, it works very, very successful, and it actually has uh, three university studies that have proved how it works successfully. What do we do through the VA to know that we're successful in the programs we're putting forward? Our specialty PTSD clinics uh, on a regular basis will review a very uh, uh, thorough uh, PTSD clinical interview called the CAPS interview, which is a sort of the standard in research and also uh, it's more intense than most clinicians use to assess are our PTSD clinics working. But what we're trying to do, that's only the, the specialty clinics, those 131, only cover a small number of the veterans who actually have PTSD at different levels. We're trying to develop a new program called measurement-based care. Uh, and actually, unfortunately, uh, there's some legislation and, uh, and IT concerns that get in the way of that. What we want to do is have veterans give us direct input of their symptoms uh, on smartphone apps and in computers. And you know how you have the white coat sy uh, syndrome when you come into the doctor's office and your blood pressure goes up? Then they say, hey, you have high blood pressure. No, I'm just afraid of you, doctor. Uh, what you, uh, what you want to do is get people at rest at different times of the day when they're in their normal lives and say, how are they doing? We want to enter that data, but right now there are security concerns uh, with the computer information. You're going to get past our firewall, what, what viruses are going to follow. We need to solve that problem, and I believe there are technological so solutions to that, but we may need your help uh, as a congressional body uh, in getting permission and legislation to collect data directly from veterans. When we have that, then every patient can say to their doctor, how am I doing, and not just in PTSD but in other problems too, and they can compare that and goes right into the electronic record. That's what we're trying to build. We've been working on it for the last four years. Wonderful, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, General Healy. Ms. Brownlee, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you to the panelists for being here. It's been very uh, enlightening. And uh, Mr. Younger, um, Dr. Winstrup gave me your book, um, and I read it over the weekend. Thank you. Um, and uh, I think, um, in some ways, your book, uh, I think, points out or tells us what we, I think we already sort of intuitively yeah. know. Um, but what your book does so well is to give us that framework to answer the question of why. And um, I, I, I really did enjoy uh, the read and encourage other uh, members on, uh, members, congressional members to read your book. Um, I wanted to um, also ask Mr. Downs, uh, your testimony was very compelling. You talked about um, transcendental meditation. You also said in your testimony about the validation, um, clinical validation of the success of the program. You said something to the effect of many public health agencies are, have validated this. Is that correct? That, did you say that in your testimony? Or just do you think TM has been validated uh, uh, as, a, as a sound therapy for mental health? I do think that transcendental meditation is a sound practice, and it's something that has to be done every day. And um, I can tell you from personal experience that after leaving uh, Boulder Crest Retreat and the Warrior Path, uh, about six months into it, I felt on top of the world, and I decided that I didn't need TM anymore. And I stopped. And I was okay for a couple weeks, um, and then I fell. And the good news is you fall forward. You don't fall backwards, and you fell forward. But I did fall. 
And uh, at that point, I kind of realized that there, I, I think I created an illusion of option. I created an illusion of choice that I didn't really need it anymore. But in order to continue to thrive, um, you do have to practice. Because every day that I wake up and I open the door, life's going to punch me in the face, one way or another. And uh, the question then becomes, well, how do you struggle well? Because struggle is just inherent to being human. So how do I struggle well? And I think that my realization was that TM was the thing that helped me struggle well. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, Dr. Cudler, I wanted to ask you, I think um, I agree with uh, Mr. Walsh's comments. If it works for veterans, we should be doing it. Um, but I think in terms of complementary and alternative uh, therapies, the most common barrier to the use is the lack, at least what the VA says, is the lack of sufficient evidence to support their efficacies. And as I look through the uh, the VA DOD clinical practice guidelines, it just, you know, for every therapy, it's, it's, you know, research focusing on the efficacy of acupuncture is still relatively limited. Not discussed in the VA DOD clinical practice guidelines. That's said for many of these therapies. Um, evidence of AAT, uh, animal assisted therapy, uh, is ongoing, but at this point lacks support. So, uh, you know, it, Mr. Takano was talking about um, the research and the impacts of lack of research that uh, may occur here. I, I guess the question for me is, why aren't we using evidence-based practices that have already been established outside of the VA and say, okay, well, we see the efficacy here. It's been proven by <laughs> university studies, whoever it is, and, and bring more efficacy back into the VA, understanding that these alternative therapies do indeed work outside of the VA. They will work, I mean, isolation and other kinds of things that in Mr. Younger's book is consistent not only with veterans, but cancer patients, as he said, and, and others. Why aren't, we, why aren't we, you know, pulling this together so that we are really meeting the needs of veterans right now, today, um, as opposed to more of these long-range um, efforts that you're talking about, which I think are valid, um, but we need, you know, we need resolve today. We can't risk losing another veteran. We have to bring this forward. So I, I don't understand why we're not utilizing what the research is telling us outside of the VA uh, to implement more of these uh, programs. Well, in, in some total, I agree with you. Uh, the balance of being a doctor, uh, especially in an age that people call it the age of evidence-based care, is that, well, you wouldn't do anything there wasn't evidence for, or why, that's not scientific. But doctors aren't scientists. And doctors try to help patients. Uh, and it's something I like about being a doctor. You've got that person in front of you. Your job's to help them, not to come up with the right answer on the test. The test is that person. And that person's going to be different, and there'll be different ways to engage and help each one. Like we've been hearing that from the panel. Over 90% of all VA medical centers have at least one kind of complementary and uh, uh, integrative health. VA has a center on complementary integrative health. We're moving forward in a number of ways. For over 30 years, VAs have had sweat lodges, most of them west of the Mississippi, because culturally appropriate uh, tribal customs are helpful to veterans with PTSD. Um, we have expanded in just about every direction. Uh, yoga, uh, meditation, just this morning, uh, there was a report on a VA study that we did on meditation with the University of Rochester. We asked them to evaluate our demonstration project and they found it very helpful. So we are moving forward and, and well, we need to do more. Uh, uh, well, I, I thank you for that. My time's up. I just wanna say though, if we had a handbook that said yes to these things, I think more doctors would be able to apply them. I Thanks for yielding. Uh, General Bergman, you recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To your lawyers, you all know the term, steel sharpens steel. And when you're in the uniform fight, you know where the steel is. I would suggest to you that when you leave the uniform fight, you have to find the new steel to keep your own sharpened. And I would suggest to you, it's right up here. And I, I love the fact that you quoted Shackleton. <laughs> the greatest example of leadership in the history of mankind who never ever once accomplished the mission they set out to do, but accomplished something greater than that. 
by leading through adversity over multiple years. Shackleton's way must read for everyone. Mr. Iskell, you mentioned that uh, the Headstrong recently received a grant from New York State to treat veterans in rural areas. Could you please describe any unique challenges in treating rural veterans? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Maureen. Um, I think the, the, big, uh, the biggest challenge in all of this, and I think it's something that's missing from this conversation and it, it's come up briefly, is, is the quality of the providers. Um, my last job in the Marine Corps, I helped build and run the recruiting, screening, assessment, and selection program for MARSOC. And you have a minimum standard that Marines need to meet before they're invited to our selection program. They have to have a certain physical fitness, a certain intelligence, a certain swim qualification. That alone doesn't make them eligible for special operations. Um, and so I think the quality of the clinicians is tantamount. And we have a vetting process and a recruiting process and a screening process for the clinicians that we work with. The greatest challenge in rural, providing rural care is the lack of clinicians. And so you have to find hybrid, hybrid approaches of getting veterans in rural areas in front of competent mental health care providers um, through a hybrid of telemedicine and in-person care. And so what we are doing is we've recruited clinicians in key cities like Ithaca, Buffalo, um, parts of Long Island that have those competent mental health care providers. We will then get the veteran to see them on some sort of regular basis, especially at the beginning, and then do a hybrid of telemedicine and in-person care. But finding those clinicians is, is the hardest part in those rural areas. Do you feel, and you mentioned something there, do you feel with the utilization of telemedicine, could you start with telemedicine or do you need a face-to-face -face first and then transition to? So I am not a medical doctor. Um, uh, I would say that our medical team uh, would think that that's very risky. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the stories that our, our medical director tells is she was treating somebody who was in Long Island uh, who is a meth addict, not in our treatment program, outside of our treatment program, was doing it over the course of a summer, um, thought he was doing much better. That fall, he comes back, is in her office, and she can tell immediately that he is still using. She couldn't tell that through telemedicine. You can't smell somebody, you can't see them, you can't see what they're doing with their fingers. Um, um, and so I think that there's a real need to be in front of a person, but I think a hybrid approach can certainly work. Okay. Uh, Mr. O'Byrne and Mr. Younger, given the approximately 40% of veterans who live in rural communities, how would you suggest that we encourage a sense of community and peer-to-peer -peer support among veterans who may not live in close proximity to other veterans or to VA or community services for veterans so that that unique but very important population who might live in some type of semi-isolation? Uh, it's a huge problem. I'm not sure I have a good answer for you. I, I, we can provide veterans communities if we have communities for ourselves. I, I don't think there's a way to solve the veteran, veteran community problem, the veteran mental health problem, without solving the wider societal problems that all of us are, are laboring under. Okay. Um, Dr. Cutler, uh, kind of a change in subject here, but uh, suicide rates. Are there any numbers that state the differences between those who have deployed versus those who have not deployed as it relates to the potential for suicide? As counterintuitive as it may seem, uh, and I think it, it calls into question a lot of the things we think we know about veterans, uh, the rates of people who have never deployed but are military members are higher than the rates of people who have deployed. Is there any ongoing data searching to suggest why that is? People are researching that question, but it would be premature to say we know why. Yeah, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Ms. Custer, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do want to say to the chairman and certainly to the panel, this is by far the most informative and effective hearing I've been in in my uh, four and a half years on this committee. So I really, really appreciate your time and sharing your personal stories. Um, I want to say to uh, Mr. O'Byrne, I'm delighted that the New Hampshire Humanities Council was helpful to you. That was an intriguing 
um, project, and I'd love to help share that type of public-private partnership around the VA and around the country and using the humanities to um, get at the heart at the heart of the matter, but uh, just thank you for your testimony. Um, and as well to Mr. Iskell and um, Mr. Downs, thank you for sharing your personal experiences. And partly I just feel optimism from this hearing, which is a rare feeling in this, in this <laughs> panel. So, um, and to Mr. Longer. Unger, thank you for <laughs> taking this to the national level and um, having this conversation. I think part of the challenge that we have and we wanna work with you is so few people out of our total population serve now, but I come from a state in New Hampshire where the very, very high percentage of uh, service and returning veterans um, back to 65,000 Vietnam veterans in my district and a uh, high percentage of people. So I just think we can help to engage in that conversation and we certainly do our best every day. Um, I wanna follow up on a, a couple of thoughts because we also are facing an opioid crisis, uh, heroin epidemic, whatever word you wanna put on it, it's happening um, across the country, but particularly in rural America, Appalachia and all the way up through New England. And I've been working with the VA, a lot of the research on PTSD and the opioid epidemic and, uh, are connected to pain management and coming out of the White River Junction VA in Vision 1. Um, I'm really excited about the progress that they're making. A, a doctor there, Dr. Julie Franklin, working with alternative pain management, alternative methodologies, um, acupuncture, mindfulness, uh, meditation, um, yoga, a, a lot of the things that you've talked about, and having fantastic results. And I've met with these um, veterans literally dropping the use of opioid medication by 50% and people having a much higher quality of life. So I, I would love to hear just briefly, my time is short, but from each of you, if you've thought about your own experience in conjunction with pain management, physical pain, and if you have any suggestions for us, and then if we have time, I'll go to Dr. Cudler about what progress is being made. <laughs> um, I, I can't really answer that. I, I haven't had much physical pain, um, but I, I was an alcoholic. I, I'm, I am an alcoholic. I, I got sober with, through AA. Uh, that, that's been my story. Uh, that's how I got sober. I, I, I wouldn't have gotten sober without it. So Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, go ahead. Um, you know, it's, I, 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 this is something that I think should be looked into. Um, you hear this statistic about 20, 21, 22 veterans a day dying by suicide. Um, there's a suicide epidemic in this country. Um, and I suspect that if you looked at a demographic overlay of who is most um, susceptible to suicide, it tends to be white males over the age of 40, maybe over the age of 50, who are on pain medicine. Um, that that might have more to do with the suicide epidemic and that veterans are really a leading edge of uh, some of these issues that we're facing in this country. Um, but I have not been able to, I've not seen any studies or research. That's just something that I would suspect. And it is very connected, both the opioid epidemic and the suicide epidemic to mental health. Four out of five <laughs> heroin users have a co-occurring mental health disorder and so trying to get the services um, I don't know if you have anything to add, Mr. Downs. Uh, just uh, something small. I think, Congresswoman, that the underlying um, discomfort is that we're uncomfortable with discomfort. And uh, I think about just exercising, I think about going to the gym. You have to break muscle to build it. Um, and somehow we think that struggle anywhere else is, uh, is bad for us. So we like to prescribe things for pain. I think that there are definitely helpful prescriptions for pain, and I would never take them away from anyone. I would suggest that we try to connect first before we prescribe, before we diagnose. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate your comments on the struggle. I'll um, yield back and take my questions to Dr. Cudler offline. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Banks. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to each of those who are here to testify today about these issues related to post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injuries, the severe issues that our veteran population faces 
uh, with these issues and, and oftentimes the lack of treatment that they're receiving. Um, Dr. Cudler, I wanted to uh, ask you a few questions. It, it appears um, to me, we, after having Dr. Shulkin testify on March 7th, to hear that I'm hearing mixed signals between him and you. Uh, he was very open to new alternative treatments. We specifically talked about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. In Indiana, in my state, um, the Hoosier taxpayers have stepped up to the plate, and this year our state legislature is funding a pilot program providing HBOT uh, treatment to Hoosier veterans due to uh, the lack of, uh, of treatment and opportunities that the veterans are receiving through, through traditional VA um, uh, treatments. So they're picking up the slack. Uh, the Hoosier taxpayers are putting our tax dollars on the table to, to fund uh, treatments like that. Yet a moment ago, uh, I was disappointed to hear you say that uh, these issues are, are uh, to quote you, too big uh, to discuss in this venue. Um, if, if not here, uh, right now before this committee, where, where are these issues and opening up more access for alternative treatments like hyperbaric oxygen uh, therapy or other treatments? Where, where is that discussion uh, appropriate to have if not here before us today? Oh, well, first of all, thank you for allowing me a chance to clarify that. Uh, I wasn't trying to imply that talking about complementary integrative treatments, including hyperbaric oxygen, which I know I mentioned by name, uh, were, were, that that was too big. I was simply saying trying to figure out where do you spend the money in, a uni in the unit allotment? Where do you put that? Do you build a new clinic or do you give 100 people this treatment? Uh, that was the part that was too big. But let's get into this. I want to be really clear that I think that if a treatment is helpful for people, then veterans should have access to it. I agree entirely with Dr. Shulkin. Uh, I don't think we can afford to wait for all the research to be in, because I know from my own career, it'll be 20 years before we can say definitively what works and what doesn't work. And even then, people will argue about it. So I'm thinking if the standard things aren't working, or if a person says, I don't want to do the standard thing, but my brother-in-law did this and it really worked for him, I know as a doctor, I better try to find that for that patient. And I would agree that hyperbaric oxygen is one of the things that I would try. Uh, along with Boulder Crest, I've met with the founders of Boulder Crest, and I, uh, on my desk is the notes for beginning a, a memorandum of, of agreement to partner with Boulder Crest. There are a lot of things we need to try. We need to meet veterans where they are in their terms. That's what medicine's really about. Then how long will Hoosier veterans have to wait uh, before the, the, these alternative treatments will be provided to them by the VA? We're going to have to find ways to uh, find providers who can provide them and ways of screening veterans to decide which way to go. And frankly, we have to educate a lot of our own line doctors who have been raised in the era of evidence-based medicine. Well, there's no evidence for that. Uh, this is what the Center for Compassion Innovation was developed to do. And it was Dr. Shulkin's idea when he was undersecretary. Uh, working with that, we've been uh, providing veterinary benefits for uh, trained service dogs. Uh, and I've actually been the person who got to redefine uh, mental health mobility uh, limitations so that we could do that under current regulation. Uh, I think we're moving much faster than we ever have, but we need to accelerate. Yeah, agreed. I, I, I appreciate the important work that you do. And speaking on behalf of so many of my constituents and, and, and those of uh, and my fellow my fellow veterans of the post 9-11 generation, we, we can't afford to wait any longer. So I'm thank you, you for your important uh, testimony here today. I yield back. Thank you, General for yielding. Ms. Esty, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I think this has been an excellent and very illuminating. I would agree with Annie Custer. Hopeful. Hopeful hearing. Um, I'm really struck, Mr. Younger, by your discussion about community. And I've wondered, have we tried speaking with World War II veterans? I, I think about a lunch I had recently with a 96-year-old who talked to me about why he doesn't talk about the war. He didn't want to do the Veterans Oral History Project. And he told me about how his mother told him, you need to sleep in a separate room till you, so you're safe with your wife. Yeah. These were people who had moral clarity, and I think that is an unbelievably important issue, and that's why I think we need to be debating an AUMF, and we need to be doing a lot in this Congress to stand behind our veterans. But what have we learned? We know about the moral clarity. What do we know about our effort to reintegrate? There were many more of them. I know that. So how do we deal with the fact that there aren't as many now? <laughs> uh, my wife was the youngest of 12 uh, from Wisconsin. Her, fa her father was 55 when she was born. He fought in World War II, uh, from Sicily to Anzio, 
all, through France, all the way through Germany and Austria, the whole deal, right, as a, a lieutenant and a captain. Um, he came home to Kenosha, Wisconsin, and he lived within, he was uh, wounded, meddled, very heroic man, he, and traumatized man. He came home to w Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, moved in with his, married, moved into a home with his wife, and his six brothers, blood brothers from his family, that had all also served, lived within a few blocks of him. That is rarer and rarer in the society. We're a much more mobile society. The Amish in Pennsylvania do not drive. Psychologists believe that one of the reasons they have such low rates of suicide and depression is that they don't drive and they all live within communities. They, they basically live within people uh, 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 their whole lives that they, uh, they can't drive away from their community, right? They have to walk away from their community that you, that you don't, can't get very far in a day of walking. So, so th that has changed in America. I'm not sure what we can do about it, but what we can, maybe what we can do is understand it and take some steps. We're not gonna ban the car. We're not gonna burn down the suburbs and live in lean-tos. I mean, I get it. But if we understand the mechanism that is driving some of this unhappiness, and let me just end, if I may, by, by making a larger point. My, the point at the end of my statement, um, I hope it didn't come across as a gratuitous political point. It was a very serious point. Our, our neighborhoods, we're not gonna tear down or rebuild our neighborhoods in more communal ways. But our largest community is the nation. And that we can do something about. And rhetoric does matter. And the citizenry is listening. And when the most powerful people in this nation sometimes talk about each other as if they are enemies of the state simply for running for office with a certain different set of ideals, when very powerful people do that, it trickles down into the psyches and into the lives of everyone. And that corrodes our um, our conceptual communities while our physical communities are also breaking down and it's tragic. I couldn't agree more. That's why I refer to my colleagues as patriots yes. when I'm in my district and say they're all patriots. Pe people, not just those who serve in the military, but people who serve in office were trying to get this country to a better place. And I, I appreciate you making that point. To our veterans on the panel, um, what can we do more, and, and frankly for the VA, about the peer-to-peer? -peer? I think it is unbelievably important. I know in my district that's been the most successful, in part precisely the programs that do not connect to the VA. They know they have the confidentiality. They know with their band of brothers. And wanted to underscore again, and sisters too. And I have a niece who served in Kabul for a year. It's been very isolating for her coming back very tough for her coming back because there are so few of her comrades who she can share that with. So anyone who'd like to comment on that, please. And again, thank you all for your service and for your telling your stories here and illuminating, not just for us, but for anybody watching what this really means. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I go back to what I, was, I said about those, those, some of those programs like Team Red, White, and Blue, Team Rebukan, Outward Bound for Veterans, um, Horse, Horses and Heroes. Heroes and Horses. Uh, these are these are programs that put veterans together, and uh, Team Red Rubicon goes around to natural disasters and helps out. I mean, that what an empowering thing, right? You're not getting drunk at the the VFW. You're 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 having really amazing uh, conversations while helping other people. I think that that kind of stuff is the stuff that we should be looking for. And Outward Bound for Veterans, you're going through, you know, you're going on trips at a week long for f completely free. Um, with other veterans that served, and you're going around to see the best parts of America. You're going down the Colorado River with a, a bunch of your veterans, or you're going sailing, or you're going kayaking, sea kayaking. I mean, these are these are things. Uh, even if you're not talking about the war itself, you're healing, right? It's like Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I go to AA, and maybe I don't talk every every day about alcohol when I talk, but I talk whatever I talk about. It's I'm healing while I'm talking about it, because everyone else there understands I'm an alcoholic and what my experiences were. And the same thing with veterans, getting veterans together in any kind of capacity, we're away from the drinking and you know things like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud to say that our, our number one source of referrals at Headstrong is veterans who have been to the program or in the program referring other veterans to us. Um, Team Rubicon's a great organization. I met my wife through Team Rubicon. Um, uh, but, um, I think that there's also, um, you know, if, if, you know, God forbid you had a heart attack and you were 
getting wheeled in in a gurney and you looked up the doctor, you wouldn't care where they served, right? You would care that they are the most competent heart surgeon um, who's going to provide that, that service. And I think one of the challenges is a lot of people don't see mental health care, a lot of veterans don't see mental health care as real medicine and health care. And there's nobody better to challenge that stigma than another veteran. Um, and then I'd finally just add there are group therapy sessions um, for all the reasons that you just discussed are critical components of what we do because you have uh, that group of veterans who are there supporting each other. I think the um, hold that thought. We are way over. Thank you yes. very much. I appreciate Mr. you giving me a little time. Thank you. Five thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. <clears throat> Mr. O'Byrne, Mr. Downs, Mr. Iskall, thank you very much for being here today and taking uh, time out of your day. We really appreciate your service to our country. We don't have a country unless we have folks like you to step up. Thank you very, very much. This country is incredibly indebted to our veterans. And uh, those of us on this committee and elsewhere on the Hill, we get it. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. O'Byrne, your testimony a, a moment ago when you started out, um, I caught something that has stuck with me, sir. Uh, and uh, Mike uh, asked this a, a moment ago is that during your experiences, some of them at the VA, when you were actually trying to advocate um, for yourself being less disabled than others thought you were, you got pushed back at the VA, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Cudlow, uh, doctor, you're the acting assistant deputy undersecretary for patient care services. Now, I'm not a doctor, I'm a business guy, but I'm assuming you're one of the head bananas over there when it comes to taking care of these folks. Is that correct? I do my best, sir. Okay, thank you very much for, you, for doing that. Our job, of course, is to help you to make sure you can take care of these, these great heroes that we have. Um, I'm gonna be listening for this in the future, doctor. Do you sense anywhere at the VA that there's some sort of attitude whereby the more patients we have, the more services we provide, the more we protect ourselves, our bureaucracy, because the goal is to take care of these people. And if taking care of these people means that they don't need your care, that's good. Am I missing something here? Our job as an organization is to help veterans and not to solve our own problems uh, as bureaucrats or doctors uh, or administrators. Uh, and I think the people I work with believe that. Uh, there's no question when you work in a giant organization, and VA is yeah. the second largest government uh, organization, uh, organizations of people, take on, the organization takes on a life of its own. But I think the dynamic in VA are over 300,000 people who are dedicated, just as you are, sir, to serving veterans. Good. Thank you very much for, and I'll, I'll be watching and listening for that in future hearings. <clears throat> as has been mentioned here a moment ago, there are about 20, roughly 20 suicides per day among our veteran population. Roughly, doctor, do you have any kind of feel for how many of those suicides have touched the VA before committing suicide? Yes, uh, of the 20, and this is related to the VA data that we've worked with several government agencies, including the Department of Defense, to pull together. This data wouldn't exist if VA wasn't there to research it. Nobody else's job. But uh, 14 out of the 20 who die on average every day are not currently using VA services. Some have never used it all, but that 14 have not used it at least the last two years. Okay, and you have an outreach program, I'm sure. I know you're a very large organization to try to bring these folks in-house. What I'm saying is touch these gentlemen, correct? Or these ladies and gentlemen, these, these folks in uniform. Reaching out, including through peer support and Great. through our vet centers, uh, 300 community-based vet centers, 80 mobile vet centers, Great. our Make the Connection website. We're doing our best to reach out. Appreciate it very much. Keep doing that, please. We have a terrific family in the state of Maine. I represent the rural part of Maine. Uh, we have more uh, veterans as a percent of our state uh, than any other state in the country, X1. And we have more rural veterans in, in our second district than anywhere in the country. Is a wonderful family, uh, Paul and Dee House, who are Gold Star parents who lost their son Joel in Iraq. And they have put together a tremendous facility in Lee, Maine, way down east. If you haven't been to Maine, you gentlemen should go to Maine because we know how to shoot straight in Maine. Uh, <laughs> and the name of the entity is the House in the Woods, and it provides places for our veterans to go with their families where they can engage in outdoor recreational activities. Each of you gentlemen, Mr. Burr, Mr. Downs, Ms. Discall, if you could comment your experience as far as healing is concerned, specifically for combat veterans coming back, are these facilities 
helpful given the experience you have had. Outdoor activities, using your hands, using your bodies, being physical with your families. Um, so, Mr. Skull, sure. Um, the short answer is yes. Um, the, the only thing I'd add to that is, uh, you know, a facility that's run by a Gold Star family. Uh, I had a Marine named uh, Sergeant Byron Norwood from Pflugerville, Texas, who was killed in Fallujah in 2004. The most important conversation I've had in my journey home uh, was with his parents. His dad is a guy named Bill Norwood, who uh, we were having barbecue in Austin, and he said to me, you know, Zach, nothing makes me happier than to see Byron's friends go on, start families, start their lives, uh, go to school, start jobs, build businesses. Um, and in a sense, that gave me permission to restart my own life. Um, and so I think any chance you have to get a Gold Star family in front of a veteran mm -hmm. um, to help them overcome survivor's guilt or grief that they're suffering from, uh, for me personally, uh, that was hugely instrumental. Thank you. Mrs. Downs? Uh, yes, I think that any of those outdoor recreational activities are key. Um, at Boulder Crest Retreat, we don't, we don't shoot pistols, we don't shoot rifles. We shoot a bow and arrow. Because when we shoot a pistol or we shoot a, uh, a rifle in the cordite, we smell the, the burn and, and the powder, uh, it, it can potentially take us back to a spot where we're sitting here telling you we're fighting. Uh, so if, if we're going to shoot something, when we shoot a bow and we get a release and we get to release something, I mean, it's, um, I just think that we have to be careful sometimes. But yes, outdoor, absolutely, man. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Uh, I'm they all answer the question perfectly, and yes, I wholeheartedly, Outward Bound for Veterans is one of those programs that takes veterans out on, on uh, outward down, out, outside activities, and they're, it's really helpful. Uh, vets like to suffer, you know? <laughs> and I mean that wholeheartedly. Put them in a bad spot and watch Struggle, them smile. Man. Mr. O'Brien, we do not suffer in Maine. We enjoy the great outdoors, but thank you for that yeah. comment. Yeah. Mr. Cutler, do you have a program Mr. at Falkland, VA. Could you wrap this? You're a little over. Yes, sir. Um, I, I'm Mr. Cutler, yes or no answer. Do you have um, programs at the VA that support these outdoor activities? We do, but it would require more time to explain. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. O'Rourke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I agree with uh, my colleague from New Hampshire who said this is the best conversation we've had in this room. And, four and a half years that I've been here. So thank you for, for bringing everyone together and, and facilitating it. And thank you each for your testimony, your work, and, and your service uh, beyond your time in, in uniform. Incredibly helpful to the work that, that we are trying to do. Um, there, are, there are, thanks to this panel, three books that I'm going to reread or read for the first time. Uh, the Odyssey. Um, I'm going to read the Lansing uh, book about the Shackleton uh, expedition. Uh, and, and thanks to, to my friend, Dr. Winstrup, who just gave me uh, a copy of Tribe. I'm going to read uh, Mr. Younger's uh, book. Dr. Cudler, um, you, you mentioned, and I'm grateful for this, uh, the fact that you're now providing urgent care uh, to veterans who have other than honorable discharges. Um, I'd like you to take a page out of Mr. Iskell's book, uh, whose organization provides mental health care for veterans, uh, regardless of military discharge, and does not wait until they are in crisis. Uh, perhaps that is too late. I think almost certainly for too many veterans, that is too late. And we know from just one four-year reporting period uh, that there were 13,000 veterans who had other than honorable discharges who before their discharge were diagnosed with PTSD, traumatic brain injury, military sexual trauma, and now are unable to get any help at all. I asked the secretary, and I'll ask you, um, I think it is within your administrative powers to extend this help, not on an emergency basis, but proactively and preventatively. And I'd like an answer by the end of the week as to your interpretation of what you're able to do, the full extent of your powers under current law, and what you will do to, to, to fulfill that, and what you need us to do legislatively to change the law to allow you to do more. Second question for you is, uh, Mr. Younger said that he's been unable, despite repeated requests, to find the number of post-9-11 veterans who've been diagnosed with PTSD. Um, do you have that as an absolute number or a percentage right now? Could you give it to us? All right, second question first. I actually got a chance, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Younger for, uh, to look at his testimony last evening. And I went to my computer, and I probably know the website better than a lot of people. There is public available information. I printed it out, and I will hand it to you. <laughs> I hope it's the data he wants, and if not, I will get you more data. 
Uh, but and, I actually was in the room in 2003 when the undersecretary said, you're going to have quarterly data, told our head of epidemiology, and they've had it every quarter since 2003 on the OEF, OIF, and we have comparison data with uh, all other ge generations of veterans. So we have that. And, and I'll follow up with you on number one, but with limited time, I want to ask Mr. Younger, uh, who, who addressed some of the underlying conditions that we're talking about trying to solve today. Uh, your, your comments about you went from uh, a position where you could not be more necessary to a position where many veterans feel absolutely unnecessary to yeah. society and, and to the country. Uh, I'll highlight the Summers family uh, who, who lost a son um, following his service, who've talked about a reverse boot camp that uh, would force us as a country to pay just as much attention and make just as much of an investment in the transition out of service as we do into service. The, the second one, um, and, and my colleague, Ms. Esty, brought this up. You talked about moral injury, and I agree with your admonition to members of Congress uh, to be responsible in, in our rhetoric. But I was also struck when I visited uh, Afghanistan with Dr. Rowe and other members of this committee. We could get from the service members there in exquisite detail what they had done that day or the day before, what their job was. But if we asked them why they were there, they'd say, I don't know, you tell me. Yeah. Um, so, so her idea of, of having a reauthorization for the use of military force that describes why we fight, what victory looks like, why we're asking people to serve is important. And then the last issue, and I know I'm bringing up three big ones, but you brought them up first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> since 9-11, fewer than 1% have served in the military. Our, our foreign policy is essentially being borne by fewer than 1% uh, of this country. What do you think about a universal service bill that helps to address the lack of community that you see nationally. It wouldn't necessarily entail military service for everyone, but some form of national service for every single American. So we have shared sacrifice and what it means to be uh, an American. I know I gave you three big yeah, ones. Uh, some of this I'll have to take for the record, but, but give it your best shot. Yeah, I'll, I'll test my memory and go backwards. I, I've, I've many times spoken about the value of national service with a military option. Uh, one of the things that seems to buffer Israeli citizens and soldiers from PTSD is the fact that virtually everyone serves in the military. I personally think it's not a moral thing to make someone fight a war they don't believe in, but it's an entirely moral thing to ask someone to contribute to the public good for a year or two. Psychologists know that the more a person sacrifices for something, the more they value it. One of the problems, I think, in America right now is absolutely zero sacrifice is asked of our citizens. Uh, you do have to pay taxes, but if you don't want to do that, uh, you, can, um, you can be fed and housed in, in prison. I mean, literally, our country asks for absolutely nothing, and I don't think that's good for the country or the citizenry. Um, as far as the morality of wars go, we know, again, from Israel that the further you travel to fight a war, the more ambiguous the uh, moral justification of it is. In the Yom Kippur War, soldiers were literally fighting on their doorsteps of their villages, of their towns. Even during incursions into Lebanon, the PTSD rate was higher because they had to travel to the combat and the, the necessity of the combat was more, um, was more in doubt. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yes. So boot camp has a, in some ways an easy job. It's training people to do something that comes naturally to human beings, which, to, which is to identify themselves as part of a group and to make the moral choice that their own impersonal welfare is less important than the welfare of the group. That is what humans are wired to do, and that's why we've survived half a million years in an extremely rough world. Um, reversing that goes against human nature, goes against a lot of human DNA, and is extremely hard. Um, and I'm not sure what it would look like to deprogram people to get them to stop thinking communally. I don't, I'm not sure how that would work. Um, I do, I'm taking you very literally. I do hear what you're saying. There should be a transition program. But one of the things I think should, that should be addressed in the transition program is, look, you're transitioning to something where there's no there there. I mean, you're going to look for connection. It will not be there. And that's not because you have a problem. It's because it has a problem. I think that's an extremely important point. And just finally, with the statistic, if I may, um, I, I, I looked, uh, and my researcher looked on the website, and my friends in the VA looked at the website. There's a lot of statistics on it. Um, the specific one I was looking for, which seems like a very obvious one, the, per, the percentage of global war on terror veterans on PTSD disability, what is that percentage? There's a lot, there's a lot of other percentages 
a total veteran population, et cetera. Um, that one, I think, is particularly interesting, and I found it particularly hard to find. I'll, I'll let you all decide that after the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your time's for expired. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to wrap up our side of the questioning with a couple of things. One, I found a um, uh, thought back years later, um, uh, after I got home from Southeast Asia, the thing I think that helped the most for me, I looked at three things. One, I have a strong faith. Uh, two, I have a very strong family, and three, I had a place to go. I, there was no question when I got out of the military exactly where I was going. So I had a real focus at the end of a time when a lot of young men did not have any focus. And you mentioned the war. Um, basically, there was, I mean, I still to this day don't know why we were in Vietnam. So for 58,000 of my fellow comrades and many close friends uh, didn't make it out of. So I think those things are important. Uh, this has been a terrific panel. And I'll just have a couple of quick questions because of the, the uh, the uh, committee has done a great job, and I thank you for being there. Mr. Downs, you stated that uh, upon seeking help from the VA, you were met with apathy, diagnosis, and denials rather than guidance, direction, and connection that you were seeking. I guess the question is, sort of, what would you do, what would you recommend that the VA do to, to uh, improve the level of care that you received in the VA? What, what would you tell them to do or recommend that they do, not tell them? So one of the things that I like to, uh, to do after PATH is to find meaning in things that I didn't necessarily find meaning in before. So I took a phrase that was familiar to me that I hadn't really thought about, which was to be the change you wish to see in the world. And that change starts six inches from my chest. And when I can change that small environment, then I can move out to 12 inches, and then I can move out to 18. So I think that what I would suggest to the VA is to just consider, um, consider what they're saying to us and what their representatives are saying. And I understand that Dr. Kudler isn't on the phone when I call the VA, um, that there's, there's, it's a massive organization. But customer care and customer service, I think, starts with empathy and starts with understanding um, what you can do, not necessarily what you can't. Here's, a, here's something, and Mr. Younger, I want, and uh, Dr. Culler, I want you to, to uh, he, uh, Mr. Younger cited a VA a 2005 IG study that showed that veterans sought less care for PTSD once they received a disability rating of 100%. Is that still true? That's very disturbing to me. I don't know if it's still true, but I will cite a, another study, a recent study that showed that veterans who got disability for PTSD, regardless of whether or not they went into treatment for it, had lower PTSD symptoms years later and were all, much less likely to be homeless or, uh, or, as I remember, die by suicide. That there are lots of positives in stabilizing someone's life in some ways, and we heard some of that from the panel, uh, and then veterans get to solve that in the way that they want to solve that. But if they want to get treatment, and we want them to get treatment, because we believe it is helpful and there's hope for them through treatment, we want to see that part too. We need to bring all this together. So what, uh, and I'll just stay with you, Dr. Cudler, um, wh what factors do you attribute to a 50% growth in PTSD care in the VA system since fiscal year 2010? And, and how has that growth impacted access to mental health care at the VA? There, there are several factors. Uh, I think one is generational. The Vietnam generation, there are still new Vietnam veterans showing up at VA today saying, I never came for help, I didn't think I had a problem, but now I think I have a problem. Uh, that generation, even though they helped get the idea of PTSD out there, were really not quick to say, I've got this problem. I think the younger generations are quicker to say, I may have a mental health problem and I think there's help for it. That's one part of it. Another part is when General Shinseki said, look, uh, you don't have to prove you were blown off that bridge on that day and that's why you have that nightmare. If you show me you were in Vietnam in a combat area, I'm gonna say you were, probably had a stressor that would be the A criteria for PTSD. That used to be a tremendous block to people getting service connected for PTSD. That helped a great deal. And then we started screening every veteran who came back from any war, or any, actually every veteran under our care, that's six million plus every year. And we screen them every year for signs of PTSD. So we now look for it and identify it and refer to treatment when we find it and make them aware they might be able to get service connected for it as well. 
uh, which can help them in a number of ways. So that, I think, those are the main reasons why I believe it's risen so much. Well, I think the thing that, that I heard today and the most encouraging thing I've heard from everyone is that it's not, it's not a yoke around your neck that's going to be there forever. You can, you can go on with a normal life, and you should go on with a normal life. I mean, I'm a lot older than you guys. You guys got a lot of living to do and a lot of fun out there. And, and the only day <clears throat> that I look out that's really, really bad is when I'm going to play golf that day. I know that's probably <laughs> going to be a bad day. But the rest of the days are pretty good. And, and I think that's what we need to be preaching to our veterans that have served this country is that, hey, you've, you've uh, spent part of your time in, in uh, protecting American freedom. And now we want you to have a fulfilling life after that. And I know uh, Mr. O'Rourke mentioned I, I, uh, my service began with a trip to the mailbox. I went to the mailbox. I got drafted, as, as millions of, uh, of us did during in my generation. But yours isn't now. Today's a, a very phenomenal all-volunteer army. It's different. And as he said, very few people uh, in this country serve and, and actually give back to the country in a meaningful way. And we need to, I think we need to look at that as a nation. Certainly have seen that in, in Israel where everybody serves in some way or not. I've been there and it's amazing. That entire country serves and they all uh, feel like that they've contributed to the great nation that they have. I, I'm not sure whether my time's expired, but I just expired it. Um, <laughs> Mr. Saban, <laughs> you are recognized for five minutes. This is what happens when you come in late and you're not paying attention. Thinking about an event I had also in basic training when I knew that I come from a small island and uh, I knew that there was someone also in training who uh, had to be discharged. And that person, because at one time in my island, everybody knew everybody. Uh, and that individual, just thinking what happened to that individual and the rest of his life. He didn't live a long life after that. He felt rejected or something like that because he had been this, I don't know what it was, but uh, when I came into this job, we had basically no BA presence in the Northern Mariana Islands. Uh, I, I had to urge on the Hawaii office to complete a contract for a private physician, and they gave us uh, an administrative person to handle appointments, and I think we're now getting a social worker, but thanks to the leadership of both Ranking Member Walls and, and, and Dr. Rowe, and thanks to Dr. Shukin, who has really given me some time and attention to many things, we may be seeing some improvements in place. Um, I am very envious to Mr. Isco, uh, talking about his project because, you know, I come from a place where there's, I think today there's no psychiatrist on the island. There may be two clinical psychologists. Uh, we're trying to get them hooked on to provide service to our veterans because what they do now is they go in front of a television screen and talk to a uh, professional who down the road may resign and they have to come back and talk to an entirely new person and retell their whole story. Um, but, um, and, and so Dr. Kuller, um, well, first, Mr. Isco, I'm, I, I really would like to talk to you some more if there's a way of getting the yeah, other love that. involved in your program. I'm just so envious, sir. But Dr. Kuller, um, again, look, I, I, I'm on the committee and I'm finally getting really some good attention and will hopefully we get more improved services to, to, to um, the veterans serving in the Northern Marianas. The last, the last census we had was like almost 900 veterans, and that was 2010. So I'm sure there's more now. Our state VA office will think that there's over 2,000 veterans uh, in a place uh, with a population of 52,000 people. So that's 4% uh, if it's 2,000. But I'd like to ask about PTS treatment options for veterans suffering PTS in rural and remote areas such as the Northern Marianas, which does not have a VA psychologist or a vet center. And telehealth is an option, but the veterans, I am hearing, I'm meeting and hearing about are very uncomfortable with that method and so may 
not seek treatment, actually. I've known, I know some who have not treat, treated sick men. Um, two or maybe three suicides in the past five years. Uh, just, it just jolts the entire VA community, especially those that serve. Uh, with, with those who committed suicide. But what can the VA do for veterans for whom telehealth is not effective? Yes, I think telehealth, as has already been brought up, is only part of the picture. It's an important part, and it helps. But having boots on the ground, and I, I think just what you said about, okay, that we've identified two psychologists on the island, and probably maybe primary care docs or family doctors, we can train those people. If, uh, if they're private, uh, and I imagine they are, they're just in there for private practice, maybe they could become choice providers uh, under the, the, the Choice Act. And uh, then we could coordinate with them in other ways. We have a PTSD consultation service through the National Center for PTSD, which actually will answer questions about how to assess and treat PTSD for any clinician in America. They don't have to work for us. So we can work on weaving this web, starting with the available things. And I'll take a page from Mr. Junker's book uh, and, and something that has worked in rural Alaska where we can work with elders of the Chamorro tribe uh, who serve a cultural, uh, they f a cultural foundation and center of gravity, and we can coach them in talking with veterans in the community on how to identify problems, how to work with them in some of the ways we've heard about today, and how to do it in a culturally appropriate way, which may lead to treatment or may lead to other solutions. So we can weave that web, but we have a lot of work to do. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Mr. Ryan, we're very glad to have you here with our committee today, and you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I think uh, you having me here and uh, trying to contribute in a small way to this hearing says a lot about you and that how you approach us in a bipartisan way, that the veterans are the center for us, uh, and we just need good ideas, and I appreciate you uh, having me here, so thank you very much um, for doing that. I used to sit on the Veterans Committee many, many years ago, and I remember all of those hearings, and I remember this one, and I will agree with my colleagues, this is the best one I've ever been at as well. I think when you're talking about getting out some good information that can really be helpful to our vets. Um, let me just make a couple points before I have a, a question or two. Um, listening, it's not either or, it's both. Uh, Mr. Younger, you made an amazing point. I'm a little upset that Dr. Winstrup didn't give me a, your book. Um, <laughs> I think I'm the only one in the room, so I'll have to work him, work him on that. Um, but you, you make the point that is the same point that Mr. Downs made. It's about connection. And it's about connection to your community. It's about, you talked about outdoors. It's about the connection to nature. And you made the point about it's about being connected to who you are at the deepest part of who you are and so this whole hearing could have been called connection we're having a veterans hearing about connection and the only place I think I would uh, disagree with you is I do think uh, we can do some things about restructuring our society I think uh, representative O'Rourke mentioned it with national service I think you see it today with young people who want to move into urban areas and use public transportation and stay in a community and live in a neighborhood and be able be connected to that place. We had somebody, a friend of mine who wrote writes for the Youngstown Vindicator. I know you all don't get a subscription, so I'll enlighten you as to what he said. He said, I grew up sitting on my front porch interacting with the neighborhood and now I come home and I drive to my suburban home and I go into my back uh, deck that's fenced in in my backyard and I hang out with myself, you know? And I think that signifies that there are some things that, that we can do here. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to uh, be a part of this. Um, I, wanna do, I wanna recognize uh, Bob Roth from the uh, David Lynch Foundation who's done an amazing job trying to outreach to veterans and school kids. Uh, I also, there's another group here, Project Welcome Home Troops, Mr. Chairman. Uh, they weren't able to testify here today um, John Osborne's here representing them. Same kind of thing. It's, it's power breath workshop, deep breathing, processing the trauma, 
and then onward to some kind of um, meditation. And I just, I think about 15 years ago when I sat on the Veterans Committee, if we had had a hearing where we had had a bunch of vets talking about yoga and meditation and acupuncture, uh, you know, you would got run out of the room. But when you go and you see what's happening in these, in these hospitals, the, the most in-demand services that are in these hospitals, whether it's mindfulness-based stress reduction, TM, Project Welcome Home Troops with the breathing, yoga, Tai Chi, because it's helping. And for us, Mr. Chairman, I sit on the Appropriations Committee, these bills are getting big. So if we can get, and we're watching these vets go from 12 or 15 prescriptions, go through some of the things you all talked about here, and they go down to two or three. Like you said, Mr. Downs, it's not about saying you can't have any, but let's get you to a point where you're not taking 15 scripts a day, and then we get the actuaries out and we figure out how much that's saving us. It's, it's everybody wins. Um, so I just I want to say thank you, and I just, Mr. Downs, I want you to talk about something, and then anyone else who would want to comment. Um, you talked about um, post-traumatic growth. Talk to me about what post-traumatic growth means and if anyone else has a comment on it, because I think that shifts the mindset of what you were all talking about. We're warriors, we can recover, we're not asking for sympathy. How do we take this situation and, and potentially turn it into a positive? Thank you, Congressman. Um, that's probably one of my favorite things to talk about. And uh, to You've got sum 20 it up, seconds to do it. To <laughs> sum it up into, <clears throat> into two thoughts, the first, um, is that when we recognize that nothing happens to us, it all happens for us, um, all the pain and suffering, it's, it's gone. And then the second is that we can choose our own way in any given set of circumstances, to quote Viktor Frankl from Man's Search for Meaning. And if we can do those two things and learn to do them, because it's a practice, it's, it's every day, it's not just once and then you're done, it's not catch and release. Um, that's post-traumatic growth. That's struggle to strength. And uh, at Boulder Crest, our definition of a hero is somebody who undergoes uh, an extreme set of circumstances, survives, and comes back to tell their story. And um, I think that those, that's key. That's post-traumatic growth. Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> Thanks, bro. <laughs> we say in Congress, you just, you seconded that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thanks again. I really appreciate your time and uh, allowing me to be here. And Mr. Takano and Tim Walls, thank you so much for making this happen. Well, thank Great you hearing. for being thank here you. with us today, too, and, and waiting a long time for your question. I appreciate you sharing with the committee. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the, the, the panel. It was an excellent discussion we had today, and, and I think a, a lot of people who were watching and other people who participated will take a lot away from it. And I really appreciate you spending your time and and come in. And Mr. Takana, I want to give you an opportunity to have any closing remarks you may have. I'll be very brief. It's been a long hearing, uh, but uh, I am intrigued by many of the uh, ideas brought up here today. Uh, national service has also been a uh, long time topic that I've been interested in. We've seen in the past presidential campaign uh, the idea of, of free college, affordable college, uh, debt free college. But um, I've always thought that there ought to be some connection some exchange uh, that, uh, uh, and that's what we do with the military. We offer young people the opportunity to serve our country, and in exchange, we offer them the GI Bill. Um, it's not s simply a transaction; it's a, it's a binding. It's a binding to the nation, and uh, the idea of a national, a healthy national identity, I think, is a good thing. Um, I, I, in my mind, is the words of John F. Kennedy: "Ask not what uh, your country can do for you, but." what we together can do for our country and for the, uh, the interests of liberty. Um, you know, uh, he was a very communitarian um, Greek. Uh, the ideas are Greek, the idea of belonging to a polis, a political community. So uh, uh, I think these are vital things that we should be talking about as Americans and uh, the idea of a reverse boot camp. Um, the idea that it's not natural and it struck me that Yes, we, it, it, a, a complex society, a complex economy demands more of the individual and therefore the type of education we have to offer people to be strong individuals, uh, to be uh, uh, viable, 
uh, and to thrive is going to take a more sophisticated type of education. Uh, so uh, very, very uh, thoughtful hearing. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for bringing together such a, an incredible group of individuals. And I really do enjoy working with you on uh, these issues that face our country. Thank you, Mr. Cano. I will just wrap it up quickly by thanking each of each and every one of you. You know, you, um, uh, Mr. Younger, I read your book. I don't agree with everything in your book, and you may not agree with everything in your book. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, but I do know that that having I look, I think about my own family. My mother's family had ten in the family. Um, I'm an only child. That obviously cured her from a large family. But uh, they they didn't have a lot. They were sharecroppers. And uh, I remember the first phone we got. Uh, it was an eight-party line, and, and you didn't know who was listening into your conversation. But we were very close, yeah. close with our cousins, close with, uh, and, and I don't know of anybody in that family, eight in my dad's family, I don't know how many, anybody in that family that ever did anything, supported each other. And then the community so supported every guy. I'll give an example on the farm I grew up on. Uh, we would we would work on our place, and then because labor was pretty short, you would go to someone else's farm and help them. You didn't hire anybody, and the, and what you got was lunch and dinner that day when you worked on their farm. You helped, you helped your neighbor out, and and I think we've lost some of that, as you mentioned. When you drive into your backyard and close yourself off from the rest of the community, your neighbors around you, you don't feel an obligation or or an allegiance to your community or to your neighbors. And I think you were spot on about that. And I think the other thing I learned today, and, and, and Mr. O'Byrne, I want to thank you for saying that uh, this, and all of you did, is that I'm here to get well and get back and be a productive member of society as I am. And, and I absolutely believe that. The veterans are some of the most productive people you'll ever meet in society, some of the most giving people you'll ever meet. So I want to thank each and every one of you for your service. I want to thank the VA. You've got a big job we've asked you to do to treat all these folks. And I think what we found is it's not one size fits all. We need to keep an open mind about what we're going to do going forward. And I think you all have helped enlighten us today with that. And, and being no further uh, uh, questions, uh, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material. And without objection, so ordered. Hearing is adjourned. That's great, man. Thank Yeah. I had no idea. That was great. I'm going to warn you after. Yeah.